A remarkable meeting. Three families are bound forever by a child whose death gave the gift of life. And last night, the families met for the first time. It's a remarkable story. Good morning, America. I'm Charles Gibson. And I'm Joan London. It is Thursday, April 25th, and when T.J. Carey was killed in a car accident last year, his parents made what must have been an unbelievably difficult decision. They allowed his organs to be used to save others, and now his heart beats inside another little boy, and his lung breathes life into a little girl, and the families are all going to be with us here on Good Morning America to share their really extraordinary story. And poignant story for us, yeah. because we were talking early in the week about uh, Irma Bombeck yeah. passing away. And Irma had been waiting for such a long time for a kidney transplant, finally got it, but it came too late and she died from complications. So many people waiting for organ transplants, and so it's a, a story worth highlighting today. Also this morning, we look at the Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis auction. Boy, were they bidden again <laughs> last night. Uh, whether it was 40 carat diamonds or a set of salt and pepper shakers, yesterday's bidding once again went through the roof. The big ring was auctioned. It was the last thing to be auctioned last night. Almost two and a half million dollars for that little puppy. What do you got in the weather? Uh, nothing that expensive, I'm afraid. No, no maps to offer that might go for high bids. However, although you can still find a spot or two of snow on our weather maps, uh, summer-like warmth has settled in on about the southern half of the country. Record highs for this date expected in some locations. I'll tell you all the warm details in just a moment. All right, and Leslie Abramson, the Menendez case helped make her the nation's most prominent female defense attorney, and now she must defend herself against allegations that could get her disbarred, and she will join us to talk about her case. Right now, the Morton Dean has all the latest news of the morning. Good morning, Mort. Good morning, Joan, and good morning, everyone. It was another breathless night at that New York auction house, big spenders buying the baubles, bangles, and beads of Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis. ABC's Antonio Mora watched the bidding for Jackie's Gym. Are you waving at me or waving at a friend? <laughs> it's expensive to wave at your friends. And everything was expensive beyond all reason. It's a big diamond. Especially the ring Aristotle Onassis gave Jackie on their engagement. Two million dollars now. After a tense bidding duel for it. Sold two million three hundred fifty thousand dollars. The buyer, a friend of Weight Watchers chairman Al Lippert. Every time somebody upped our bid, it caused another small crisis, but uh, I think uh, we were determined and uh, we went out in the end. What were you hearing from him on the phone every heavy time? Heavy breathing, you know? heavy breathing. <laughs> the excitement generated by the first night's exorbitant prices brought a larger standing room only crowd to the second night's auction. A crowd that was here as much to buy a piece of history as to be a part of it. I think it's been one of those experiences that you never forget once you're part of it. One thing became clear. Nostalgia for items of Jackie as a Kennedy fetched premiums over Jackie as an Onassis. Compare a diamond and emerald engagement necklace that Onassis gave her. Sold 250000 That's only double the estimate. But this ring that JFK bought, it sold for 375000 Almost 50 times the estimate. It shows that the Kennedy mystique lives really on and will for a long, long time to come. Maybe live for as long as a diamond. Antonio Mora, ABC News, New York. A colleague said Jackson, Mississippi firefighter Kenneth Torns was a time bomb waiting to go off. Yesterday, police say he did go off, that he shot and killed his wife, drove to his firehouse where he killed four supervisors. There was a chase. Police captured Torns and seriously wounded him. The Unabomber suspect fails to regain his freedom. Ted Kaczynski claimed he should escape prosecution because government leaks tainted any future jury. A federal appeals court yesterday rejected that claim. After months of bickering, finally a budget agreement. Congressional and White House negotiators have agreed on a budget for 1996. The House and Senate will vote on that bill today, and ABC's Bob Selnick reports. On the, on Chief of Staff Leon Panetta, the key White House negotiator, has urged Democrats to support the $168 billion discretionary funding deal. Republican congressional leaders will work their side of the aisle. Now, some will complain the cuts are not deep enough, and others are going to complain the cuts go too far. But I, I believe the final analysis is that we'll save about $23 billion. On one of the last issues to fall into place, Mr. Clinton won the right to restrict logging operations in the Tongass National Forest. He also saw funds restored for the student loan program and his pet project, AmeriCorps. 
Some conservative Republicans intend to vote against the bill, preferring to continue emergency funding measures through Election Day. Because then we could really take it to the public and say, we're going to have a referendum on this issue in November. You get to choose the American voters, more spending or less spending. But GOP negotiators feel that on the issue of overall spending cuts, they won. Now uh, that it's over, we can uh, shake hands and uh, tell the American people we did our best for our side, but we've got something that the country can be proud of. Of course, a complete budget accord would require agreement on entitlement programs like welfare, Medicare, and Medicaid in addition to discretionary spending. And that seems beyond the reach of Congress and the administration. Mort? Thank you, Bob. Bob Zelnick on Capitol Hill. An ominous reminder of the world's worst nuclear accident. Officials in Ukraine report a minor release of radiation at Chernobyl, at the Chernobyl nuclear power station. They describe what they call a serious incident in the reactor, but say it was quickly controlled without harm. Tomorrow is the 10th anniversary of the Chernobyl disaster. Secretary of State Christopher is making the rounds again today. He held a breakfast meeting with Israeli Prime Minister Perez in Jerusalem. Then Christopher flew to Damascus for another talk with Syrian President Assad about how to stop the fighting across the Lebanon-Israel border. On the scoreboard yesterday, 11-8. 11-9, 10-8, 24-11. No, not football scores, but baseball scores. In this season of mega-run games, Minnesota's defeat of Detroit yesterday, 24-11, was the highest-scoring American League game in 26 years. Six minutes after the hour. Spence, but the most important score, the Sox 11, the Rangers 9. All right, the Beloveds, they got one. Good morning. I'm happy for you. Let's take a look at today's weather. No uh, numbers that high. Well, no, actually, much higher numbers on our weather map today. Clear skies here along the Atlantic coast and down through the southern half of the nation. A little trickle of light snow in the central Rockies and some stormy weather moving into the upper Midwest. Light to moderate rainfall generally, but some locally heavy thunderstorms will occur from the Great Lakes down to the western portion of the Ohio Valley. High temperatures today will reach near record levels down through parts of Texas where highs will be well into the 90s, 80s generally across the southern tier of states and some 100s in the desert southwest. That's a look at the national weather. Here's a look at what's happening where you are. Good morning, I'm News 5's Patty Derrick. Some light rain you might see when you're heading out the door for today, but right now more of the significant rain activity is up to the north. A wind advisory for today could see about 67 degrees, winds out of the west about 20 to 35 miles an hour, and it looks like we're going to be dry again through Sunday when we have a chance of a shower and 53 degrees. We'll have more details for you at 1130. Let's get back now, though, to Good Morning America. We have a truly amazing story this morning of courage and sacrifice. A baby girl and a baby boy are alive today because they received the organs of a newborn killed in a car accident. It was a, a tremendously difficult decision for the parents of T.J. Carey to donate his heart and lung. But today, the two organ recipients, Taylor Williamson and Joshua Diaz, are healthy and happy. And we will meet all of the families in just a few moments. In fact, the families met each other for the first time just last night it's a nightmare that no one should have to go through it's very very difficult TJ he was just a month old and I was broadsided our son was in the back seat in his car seat and that's where the impact of the accident took place so I went to Children's Hospital you know as nicely as they can be they ask if you'd be willing you know to uh, help someone else as hard of a decision as it is it's something that uh, we felt for ourselves, you know, we wouldn't want another family to go through what we're going through when we could be there to help them. Hi. To see and meet and know these people, I think for me anyway, it's uh, therapeutic. <laughs> oh, did you all take a picture? Are you sure you're okay to be here? How you here? doing? How you doing? Joe? Yeah. Peter, how you doing? It's incredible to realize that a part of your son is still living. You can't really describe that. Big old brown eyes, don't you, buddy? Like I said, thank you doesn't quite do it justice. Seeing two healthy babies is enough. Wow. Nice to meet you guys. They probably had the same feelings that we so. did, because they both thought that they would lose their children, too. So anytime you talk to another family that's gone through the same thing, there's a connection there. Oh, you went in here, too. Okay. And joining us now from Los Angeles are Peter and Deborah Williamson and their daughter, Taylor. Vicki Carey, who made the decision with her husband to 
donate her son TJ's organs, and Freddie and Rosalba Diaz and their son Joshua. And good morning to all of you. Vicki, let me start with you. Uh, what was it like to meet these two families who had lives saved because of your decision? Uh, it was miraculous last night. It was um, so um, heartwarming to see these two happy and healthy babies so full of life and they're just beautiful children. It was just wonderful. It must have been an incredibly tough decision to make just moments after you lose your newborn child. Had you and your husband spoken about this or did you make that decision then? Well, um, I think we've made the decision for ourselves, mostly, you know, when you fill out your driver's license and, and agree to be a donor, and I don't think anyone really thinks about um, their children, and especially since TJ was just a month old. Um, mm -hmm. Of course, we never had talked about that for him, but I think for ourselves, then it made it easier once we knew we would that um, our child would also. You are pregnant and you are expecting mm -hmm. a baby. What will you tell your son or daughter about their brother, TJ? Um, that he was a hero, that he was able to save the lives of two other babies. And because of that, um, they're living and, and two other families didn't have to um, endure the tragedy of the loss of a child. Mm. And, um, you know, we want to stay in contact with the Williamsons yeah. and Diaz's and uh, let, you know, our our new new baby also know them also. Oh, so. that is so wonderful. Peter and Deborah, mm -hmm. first of all, how's little, how is little Taylor? Doing great. Doing great? Doing great. Peter, what was this like for you? Well, uh, before we got the transplant, it was, it was very difficult not knowing what was going to happen. Um, it's it's an awkward situation because you're certainly not hoping for, for someone else's tragedy. Yeah. Uh, you're hoping that a, a positive byproduct can result from a tragedy. And uh, we were very, very fortunate that we were just about out of time. Yeah, and we Deborah, were down to less than a week. Deborah, a year and a half ago, what, what had you and your husband really thought about, about organ donors and transplants? Have you all talked about it and have you really changed your opinions, obviously? Well, um, previously, just as Vicky stated, we were both um, donors on our driver's oh, license. Okay, so you had talked about it. Oh yes, and we had talked about it, um, you know, quite a long time ago. But we'd never ever talked about it in terms of a child, <laughs> just with yeah. us. Freddie Diaz, I know you're going to do the answering since uh, English is not your wife's first language. But how, what did you thought about it before, and what was it like meeting TJ's mom and dad? Well, first of all, I was very terrified about the transplant operation, very long operation. And last night I was very, very anxious and scared to meet him. Not scared, just more nervous than anything. Just that you wouldn't possibly be able to put into words your feelings? Basically, I'm very nervous right now myself. Uh, how's little Josh doing? He's doing very good. He's uh, responded well. He's been with us for over a year now which um, we're very happy to have them here. You know, one of the problems, I mean, we have so many people out there waiting for organs. We have so many people dying each day waiting for organs. Freddie, you guys have gone through this. You've had your son's life saved. What would you tell the folks out there watching this morning about this? I would tell everybody to really think about organ donation. It's very important out there. Somebody's tragedy can help somebody else's life. Mm. And we're so. looking at that little life right now, looking at little Josh. Peter, Deborah, what would you tell folks listening this morning? Because it really is, a, I guess, an educational process we have to keep going through. Um, I think probably that, importantly, people need to talk about it beforehand. I think people will often make arrangements what will happen to their children if something should happen to them, but they don't talk about what would happen if something happens to their child. And I think people need to think of that because tragedies do happen and goodness can come out of tragedies as we have all experienced here. And as uh, Vicki and her husband are here to say today, I'm sure that part of their little son lives on right there next to you, Vicki. 
Yes, he does. He does. He and does. good luck with your new baby to come. Thank you <laughs> Thank all, you. families. So nice Thanks to see two lot. healthy, healthy little children there. We also want to say our thanks to Children's Hospital in Los Angeles. Charlie? Thanks, Joan. It's uh, 15 minutes now after the hour. As I think everyone knows, the retrial of Eric and Lyle Menendez ended recently in a verdict of first-degree murder for the shotgun killings of their parents. Now, Leslie Abramson, Eric Menendez's attorney, is being forced to come to her own defense. During the trial's penalty phase, one of her own witnesses, a psychiatrist, William Vickery, testified she ordered him to unethically alter evidence. That threw the proceedings into a turmoil. The trial, of course, is now over. The judge's gag order has been lifted, and Leslie Abramson is free to speak out, and so he, she is joining us this morning from Los Angeles. Leslie, good to have you with us. Good morning. Your own witness, as I mentioned, Dr. Vickery, the psychiatrist to Eric, testified under oath during the trial that at your direction, he altered notes about his sessions with Eric 24 different times. Did you tell him to delete sections of his notes that would hurt your client? No, no, not at all. I told him to edit out sections of his notes that the judge had already ruled uh, were not admissible in the trial, and, and there was nothing inappropriate in doing that. On his own initiative, he apparently took out some parts where all I had asked him to do was to clarify, and he actually went through the notes. In some sections, he did what I had asked him to do, which was to clarify certain things, and in these particular instances, which were three three little sections of the notes, he chose to take them out. He even rewrote the notes without telling me. So it was, uh, it was quite a shocking thing when, when he is testifying about it in the trial. I'm hearing about it for the first time along with the rest of the world. Well, there were some sections that seemed so strong as to what your client had apparently said to him during those sessions. One note that said, hate this man, this woman, want them out of my life. Another section, couldn't wait. I wanted to kill them. No, 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 nothing said that. There was no section that, that was a sentence that said, couldn't wait, wanted to kill them. Those words appeared in his recounting a dream, a nightmare okay. that he had All had. Right. All right. All right, I'm sorry. Corrected on that sentence. But, but you know what's interesting, Charlie? This thing about hating them. In the fir the, all of this happened three years ago, before, the, uh, before the, the very end of the first trial. And when I'm examining this witness in that first trial, I'm asking him questions about these references to hating the parents. Um, he took it out of his notes, but I didn't realize it at the time, and it wasn't something I was concerned about. And I'm eliciting from him on the witness stand that same information. It was very strange. Had you threatened to take him off the case at no. any time? No, never. No, never. I mean, what I did with him is what I do with all expert witnesses. I sit down, and particularly he was not a crucial witness in either trial. I had a different psychiatrist testifying about the real issues having to do with what happened at the time of the crime, what led up to it. He was just at the tail end for a limited purpose. And I said to him, as I would anybody, you know, you're not a crucial witness. You don't have to testify. These are very cryptic, um, hard to read notes, and they're notes of therapy sessions, which aren't usually the most coherent narratives that you're going to get. And I said to him, if there's a problem with these notes, you don't have to testify. And that's all I ever said I, I along saw, those I, lines. I saw Dr. Victory quote, or Vickery quoted just in the LA Times recently on the 19th saying, I know that's what she's saying. I honestly believe that's what she remembers. It's not my memory. I would never ever take anything out of my notes that I think is important. Well, the interesting thing is he, he, he does maintain that what he did take out of his notes wasn't important. And frankly, if, if you looked over the whole 101 pages of notes, these little cryptic things aren't important because the whole narrative and the whole life history appears later on in the notes when he's having sessions with Eric where Eric isn't hysterical and psychotic and hallucinating and delusional, which is how he described him in the early sessions where these little phrases were lifted. Where does this incident now stand? Investigation? Are you under investigation? No. No. It's, it's just going to stand as it is now and I don't think anything is going yeah, it, it was a discovery dispute. You know, we're sort of familiar with those from the Simpson case. In the Simpson case, when these things would arise, a lawyer would be fined $900. Um, in our case, that didn't even happen. The judge made no findings, took no action. So I don't think anything's going to happen. All right. Leslie Abramson, good to have you with us. Good to talk to you again. Thanks. It is 19 minutes after the hour. We'll be back.
We have a picture of Jacqueline Onassis that I want to show you. There she is. Now, you can tell that she probably had a bobby pin in her hair, can't you? I have a bobby pin right here. Let's start bidding at $15,000. Do I get sixteen? Do I get $20,000 for this bobby pin that once belonged to Jacqueline? Seventeen eight. You got seventeen eight. And the bobby pin is sold to the gentleman and from Virginia for $20,000. I was brushing my hair. I wasn't oh, really it's bidding. It's crazy. It's I know. crazy what yeah. they are bidding. A salt and pepper shaker at the auction. Salt and pepper shakers. 18,000 bucks? Yeah. 18,000 clams for that. A lot of money. School textbook. French Zephyr. verbs. That went for 42,500. French verbs. Absolutely. All right. And the desk. This I mean, is the desk you're going to study used? French verbs. Why not? <laughs> this is a beautiful desk, though. It, it is. was that used by gorgeous. President Kennedy to sign the Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. It sold for one million four hundred and thirty-two. But that truly has historical value. Though. Yes, it does. It absolutely. I, does. I must say, if I had a chance to bid for anything, I would love to have bid for the desk. But I, you know, two thousand, three thousand. That's about it. Of course, the, diamond, the diamond ring, ring. at the end. Yeah. Two million five hundred eighty-seven thousand five hundred dollars. So don't forget the extra five hundred. We'll so I'm Tom Selleck from Detroit. Good morning, America. That's the tough one. Not sure about which city there. There was sort of a pause for a moment. Just thinking about my relatives. Yeah, but he's here in New York, uh, live in the studio with us this morning. Who's going to get the fun. maddest at me? <laughs> we'll see if we can get him in some trouble this morning. All right, good morning, everyone. I'm John London. And I'm Charles Gibson, Thursday, April 25th. And Tom Selleck has been a leading man on television, of course, in movies. Well, now he has moved into the political arena and the leading man in an effort to help the nation's children learn some basic moral values and Tom will be here to talk about his new passion and other roles keeping him very, very busy these days. Can I make one personal mention? Sure. This is a Take Your Daughter to Work Day. Yeah. For our executive producer, Mark Burstein, oh, right. we hope this is Have Your Daughter During Work Day. Uh, They're at he, the hospital. He and his wife, Lori Beecher, have been waiting and waiting and waiting for uh, their daughter to come. Every and morning we say, oh, you're here. Yeah, but he's he off at the hospital this morning. this morning. We think we hear things are underway, and we hope there's good news by the end Absolutely. of the day. We wish, our, wish them our best. Also ahead, uh, Newt Gingrich is going to be here, Speaker of the House of Representatives. You think he's conservative, but you don't know how far back he really would like to go. Try the dinosaur age. It's a time that has always fascinated him. Uh, once when we were on, uh, just about to go on with a political interview, he said, you know, we ought to do something fun sometime. Like go down to the uh, American Museum of Natural History in New York and look at the dinosaur exhibit. He said, I love that. Let's take some cameras and go down there. So we did. The Charlie other day. said, okay. Went walking with Newt Gingrich through the exhibit, and we'll show you that to tour in just a few moments. All right, also coming up is having your tubes tied as effective in pre preventing pregnancy as many women believe. We will hear some doubts raised in a major new study. Right now, though, an update on the morning's news developments from Morton Dean at the news desk. Hi, Mort. Hi, Joan. Good morning again, everyone. Well, last night it was the eye popping jewels of Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis that went for eye popping prices. Her 40 carat engagement ring from from Aristotle Onassis was auctioned for $2,350,000. It's pre-sale estimate, 600000 Last night's total take was $9 million. Kenneth Torn's job was to save lives, but the firefighter is accused of taking five lives. In Jackson, Mississippi yesterday, police say Torn's killed his estranged wife, then shot and killed four supervisors at his firehouse. Torn's is hospitalized after a shootout with police. After months of dieting on temporary spending measures, the federal government will have a budget for this year. With compromises from all sides, the House and Senate are expected to pass it today, and the president says he will sign it. A somber signing on the White House lawn yesterday, surrounded by survivors and families of victims of terrorist attacks, including the Oklahoma City bombing, the president signed the anti-terrorism bill. It was a great night for Brooks and Dunn. They were named Entertainers of the Year at last night's Country Music Awards in Hollywood. Other winners, the Mavericks, named best group for the second consecutive year, and Shania Twain took home two trophies for the best new female singer and best album. Thank you. And that's the news, 33 after the hour. The winner of the award for the best weather person yeah. <laughs> of all time. I, I like Shania Twain there. I, 
I'll get rid of the weather, weather award just uh, so that the, the twain shall meet. <laughs> Let's take a look at what's happening here in the east. It's going to be a sunny day and down across the southern tier of states, warm and dry. In the upper Midwest, a stormy day with uh, some thunderstorms scattered through the area. Some could be powerful, but generally the rainfall here will be light to moderate. And out west, a calm day, hot in the southwest, a little spot of snow in the central Rockies. Looking ahead, we can uh, expect a weekend of wet weather in the nation's midsection from the northern plains and upper Mississippi Valley southward down to the Gulf Coast. Heat wave out west and uh, calm and clear weather in the east. That's a look at the national weather. Here's a look at the weather where you are. For this morning, a wind advisory. As a matter of fact, that's for all day. We'll have west winds 20 to 35 miles an hour and gusty, possibly a morning rain shower, too, when you're heading out. Temperatures in the 60s for today. We'll have partly sunny this afternoon, about 67 when you're ready to head home. Windy tonight and cloudy, 36 degrees. Colombian coffee, 34 and a half past the hour. Charlie? Thanks, Spencer. Next, we take a look at a method of contraception that may not be as effective as most people think it is. That when Good Morning America continues. Thirty-six after sterilization as an effective method of birth control is the focus of this morning's edition of The Healthy Woman. Nearly 10 million American women have chosen tubal ligation as a contraceptive, but now a government study reveals the procedure has a surprisingly high failure rate. And joining us from ABC station KGO in San Francisco with more on the study is our own Dr. Nancy Snyderman. Hi, Nancy. Hi, Joan. You want to start off ex just explaining what happens in tubal ligation? Sure, this is the most common sterilization technique in the country, and in this, the technique basically is simple. A tubal ligation means that you cut the, or separate somehow, the fallopian tube, the fallopian tube being the channel between the ovary and the uterus. You can do it a couple of ways. You can literally cut it and tie off the two ends. You can put a steel surgical clip in the middle as a roadblock. Some doctors will cauterize it and burn it. But the whole idea is to stop the travel of the ovary to keep it from being fertilized in the tube by a sperm and then continue its path on down to the uterus, the most common form of sterilization in the country. And it's supposed to stop it forever, but what was the failure rate in this study? Well, we've always sort of quoted a 1 in 250 as a failure rate, meaning that even if you get this, your chances of still getting pregnant are about 1 in 250. Well, now we have to revise this. A new study from the Centers for Disease Control looked at over 10,000 women and followed them for about 10 years and found that, in fact, the failure rate is more like 1 in 50, Ooh. with women 28 and younger having a higher failure rate than those women 34 and over. So obviously the longer you are fertile, yeah. the higher your chance of getting pregnant. In fact, I talked to a woman yesterday who when this came out said, you know, I had a tubal when I was 30 and at 42, guess what? My husband and I found out we were having a baby. And I mean, they thought they were going crazy when this happened, but yeah, the failure rate does exist. So, uh, but I think I hear you saying that the younger the woman, the higher the failure rate. Do we know why? Well, we think it's because, in fact, there are more years of fertility. And so what the experts are saying is this. Look, this is still an excellent means of contraception, of, 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 of sterility, of preventing pregnancy. But it is not foolproof. So it's not that you have to use condoms or some other barrier method between the time you get this operation until the time you stop being fertile. But it does mean that if you believe you are pregnant and you start having the symptoms of pregnancy, you really should go see your doctor. A third of the women who got pregnant in this study had tubal pregnancies, which means they started having a fetus develop in the fallopian tube, and there's no way that a fallopian tube can carry a fetus to term, and that, in fact, is a surgical emergency. So a woman still has to be very in touch with her body and check in with her doctor if there are any questions. All right, Nancy, thank you very much. You bet, Joan. All right, we'll be right back. Good Morning America's Healthy Woman is brought to you by Tylenol. It is now 18 minutes before 8 o'clock. Well, what would you think is House Speaker Newt Gingrich's greatest passion? Is it the contract with America? Is it making Democrats' lives miserable? Well, maybe. But it also just may be that the speaker's greatest passion is dinosaurs. The last time he was on the program, just before we went on to talk about politics, he said, you know, sometime we ought to do something fun. And he began to talk about his love for paleontology. He said, you ought to bring your cameras along. Come with me on one of the periodic visits I make to the American Museum of Natural History, where really the biggest dinosaur exhibit in the world exists. 
And so, earlier this week, I met him at the Hall of Ceristian Dinosaurs. Mr. Speaker, true that you have a Tyrannosaurus Rex head in your office still? Well, in the middle of some big argument, you look over and you see this huge skull of an animal that 65 million years ago was very busy, very important, and looking for a constituent to eat. <laughs> and you just, it breaks all the tension. Of course, now the constituents are looking for members to eat, so well, I don't know, maybe, it's, maybe, part it's, of the maybe process. it's turned on you. Well, this job gives you access to travel around the country. Do you get time to sneak away and come into we an try, like this when you're I, in New York or other cities? I try to, once or twice a month when I'm somewhere, go to a zoo or go to a museum. I just find learning and learning about nature to be so fascinating. And, and uh, you know, and you often you come into contact with a lot of young people and so you, you see their excitement, their sense of discovery. Go ahead, touch it. Mm -hmm. What's it feel like? Museum Provost Mike Novacek gave a tour of a new dinosaur wing to these kids from Manhattan Intermediate School 44. And the speaker and I tagged along. Predictably, a close encounter of the Jurassic kind brought out the kid in the speaker, and sometimes the professor as well. Yeah, why don't you, just for a second, why don't one of you volunteers just put your arm down there next to it for a second. See what I mean? When I was young, I was just like a lot of young people, I was fascinated by dinosaurs and fascinated by the fact that there was life before us. And so I, I got absorbed and have never really gotten over it. I read somewhere that you'd even thought about being a paleontologist. Absolutely.